Hello, everyone. My name is Margaret Huang, and I'm the president of the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's a great privilege to be with all of you today and with my colleagues who are speaking at this event. And I'm so glad that you've joined us today to honor the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and to talk about how we can employ the lessons he taught us to help create a nation and a world where the human rights and dignity of every person are respected and we have equal opportunity for all. Right now, we need his lessons more than ever. As we all saw last week, we are in the midst of a crisis in the United States. This is a moment of great peril, a crisis of white nationalism that has been directly encouraged and abetted by our sitting president. The violent mob that stormed the Capitol last week was not made up of protesters. They were domestic extremists, terrorists who use violence to achieve their political goals. We must face the fact that there is a large and growing base of far-right extremists in America who want nothing less than to rip apart our nation in the name of white supremacy. Perhaps even worse, there are many more millions of Americans who are willing to suspend disbelief and fall under the spell of extremist lies and conspiracy theories that are, at their core, all about promoting hate and white supremacy and breaking down our faith and trust in the democratic institutions that hold our country together. This movement has so infiltrated our political system that eight members of the US Senate and 139 members of the House voted to overturn a free and fair presidential election. We know, of course, that this is not all new. It's an outgrowth of hundreds of years of white supremacy and the systemic oppression of people of color, a legacy that continues to haunt our country and our institutions in many ways. Nowhere was that more clear than in the vast disparity between the tepid way the police prepared for and responded to the domestic terrorists who occupied the Capitol and the manner in which the police earlier responded with overwhelming militarized force to Black Lives Matter protesters in the same city. A long overdue reckoning with extremism and racism in our country is at hand. This year, the Southern Poverty Law Center will mark our 50th anniversary. We have fought over these decades to ensure that the promise of the civil rights movement becomes a reality. Over the last year, we have crystallized our mission going forward and recommitted ourselves to working with our partners across the South and beyond to dismantle white supremacy, to strengthen intersectional movements, and to advance the human rights of all people. As we have for decades, we will continue to expose and combat the white nationalist movement and other far-right extremists who pose a dire threat to our democracy and our nation. But this is a fight that requires all Americans of goodwill and compassion to stand up and make themselves counted. We need to set a different example, the kind that Dr. King set, with a message of truth, love, and peace. So thank you for being here today. I hope you enjoy this discussion and that it inspires you to help bring about the change that we need in, the, in America. Thank you so much for being here. And Taffany, I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you for being with us. Um, it is such an honor to have you leading the helms of Southern Poverty Law Center at a time um, as su such as this, the time that we're in. So I'm really grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I am Taffany English, Director of the Civil Rights Memorial Center, a project of Southern Poverty Law Center. The Civil Rights Memorial Center is an interpretive center that is intentional in sharing the history of past civil rights martyrs and connecting that history to what we're pre presently facing today. Today is actually would have been 
Dr. King's 92nd birthday. And I am so honored that you all have joined us to not only commemorate his life and legacy, but to really be intentional in setting our path forward for making this a just and equitable society for us all. And I am so honored that we have an amazing lineup of speakers for you today. Ms. Cheyenne Webb Kreisberg has built a lifelong career as a voice for hope, justice, equality, and human rights. She has worked over 40 years empowering young people to strive for excellence and work hard to become better versions of themselves. Mrs. Kreisberg is affectionately known as the youngest activist of the civil rights movement. Dr. King himself titled her his youngest foot soldier. Ms. Kreisberg is a native of Selma, Alabama. And um, during this time, she was very intentional, inquisitive, and wanted to be a part of the movement. Mrs. Kreisberg is also an author. And she authored the book, co-authored the book, Lord Selma, Lord Selma. And I'm so honored that she's here today to offer reflections, not only about the legacy of Dr. King, but what that legacy means today. And after Ms. Kreisberg, we have a special pre-recorded message from Jamie Harrison. Mrs. Kreisberg, I yield to you. Good afternoon. Thank you so very much to President and CEO uh, Juan, Mrs. Juan, and also to my dear friend, uh, Director Tapping the English for giving me this opportunity to share on such an occasion and the observance of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So we are here today to reflect on the life and legacy of a man who sowed the seeds of hope and healing for America. It's needed now more than ever. A man who led by example and taught us the values of courage, the values of truth, justice, compassion, dignity, humility, and service that truly defined his character and empowered his leadership. I am a true testimony of the importance and the inspiration that Dr. King bestowed upon me as a child in Selma, Alabama. I feel so grateful to have had the opportunity to meet Dr. Martin Luther King at seven years old. And yet, no matter how many tributes that I give to Dr. King since his death, I know deep down in my heart that I could never pay the debt that I owe to this great man. Dr. King, impacted my life in a most profound way. He has left an indelible impression in the memoirs of my mind from childhood to present. But Dr. King gave me hope. He gave me a sense of achievement, which motivated me as that little girl growing up in that movement to want to do something to make a difference. However, what led to be the most traumatic experience of my life was my participation as the youngest eight-year-old child on the Bloody Sunday March on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. I'll never forget the many threats that had been made about the possibilities of what would happen to anyone who participated on that particular march. But I had made up in my mind as that little girl that I wasn't gonna let nobody 
turned me around. I was there. But you know, even after 56 years, as I reflect on that bloody Sunday march on that Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, I often question just how far we have come as a people. Much blood, sweat, and tears have been shed in an effort for African Americans to gain the right to vote. And yet today, we still have a long way to go. 46 years ago, as I talked to the late Congressman John Lewis, we reflected and we talked about those times. But even now, 56 years later, that struggle is not over. Today, not only in Southern states, but all over the United States, racism still reels its head in an attempt to disarm people of their identity and respect as human beings. Racism is still at an all time high. So when we look at what Dr. Martin Luther King days should mean to our country today. I reflected on everything that happened and everything that people fought, died, marched, and struggled for in the 60s it was for African Americans to gain the right to vote. And Black Americans fought the plight of condemnation exploitation, segregation, degeneration, and victimization. And today, our concerns are yet the same. Who would have thought that our nation's capital would be subjected to the mob attack of that caliber, which has led for state capitals across the country to be put on alert, saved commentary. This is only one of the many incidents that speaks to the fact that when Dr. King left us, discrimination did not die with him. When Dr. King left us, injustices did not die with him. When Dr. King left us, segregation did not die with him. Bigotry did not die with him. We must fight on. The time has come for us to continue to have meaningful and lasting dialogues about the things that will unite us and fight to resolve those things that divide us as a nation. This is vividly a season of unprecedented change. We all have been tremendously touched and impacted by the pandemic, racial, social, and political unrest. Martin Luther King days now should mean to our country a time for us as a people to evaluate our past, examine our present, and chart a new course for the road of recovery for him. Martin Luther King days should mean to our country today that we must work together wiser and stronger, just what we witnessed in Georgia, to work harder in organizing, strategizing, and mobilizing. We must act. Martin Luther King days should mean that we must be willing to not just talk about 
the racial inequities that exist in housing, education, economics, healthcare, and criminal reform. Now is the time to put some actions into our words. Again, we must act. Martin Luther King Jr. days for us today should mean a call to action for us to return to our communities and began to engage in building a more inclusive community. This calling is an opportunity for us to do what we need to do individually and collectively in our community is very, very clear. And as I close, Martin Luther King Jr. days should mean for our country today that individually and collectively, we must seek to lift each other up, to respect and be kind to each other, to listen to each other, to encourage each other, to love each other as brothers and sisters and work together and walk together without getting weary. So we're here today to recommit ourselves to stand up, to speak up, and to do something to help us to become that beloved community that Dr. King stood for. We can make this world a better place if we too embrace similar principles of that of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So I leave you with these questions. What do you believe in? What is your dream? What is your mountaintop? And most of all, ask yourself this question. What are you going to do? Thank you. Hello, I'm Jamie Harrison. You know, Dr. King's birthday is always a good day to reflect to reflect on the progress made, but also on the work left to be done, to reflect joyfully on the achievements, but to also remember the existing and oftentimes painful obstacles that still remain. As of late, many of our communities cannot escape that pain, a pain that is chronic, unyielding, personal, and historical. For as long as we've known ourselves, many of us have felt it. Most black folks have simply learned to live with it. But watching the endless stories this past year from Breonna Taylor to Ahmaud Arbery, and yes, watching George Floyd being pinned to the ground, gasping for air, calling out for the loving embrace of his deceased mother, it shook us to our very core and forced us to realize that we can no longer tolerate the pain. We're tired. Our communities are tired. We're fed up. The days of sitting on the sidelines hoping for a solution are over. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. King said, we will repent not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. The good people in this country are no longer sitting by silently. We are all standing up and speaking out, declaring boldly, enough is enough. We're done with the racial profiling, the bias and over-policing that have plagued our communities for decades. We're tired of lawmakers responding to hate crimes with prayers but no meaningful words. We will no longer tolerate the inequities in economic opportunities, health care and education. Folks are speaking up about the injustices they face and are taking direct action at the ballot box to change it. 
You know, young and old alike went to the polls over these past few months to let their voices be heard. New leaders are stepping up to run for office and to serve as the voice of the voiceless. Every American, regardless of their background and status, deserve to be seen, to be heard, and to be valued. I ran for office because I felt that the timeless words of the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, has to become meaningful. And those words have to mean more than just beautiful prose. We cannot stop fighting because our nation deserves leaders who will do more than pay lip service to injustice and equality, but will work to end them. As James Baldwin once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. For the sake of our children who are our nation's future, we must find a path forward and realize Dr. King's dream for racial and economic equity. Thank you. Thank you to Ms. Cheyenne Webb Kreisberg. That was such a powerful, eloquent message and definitely embodies the legacy of Dr. King and the work of so many others in the movement. And I also wanna thank um, Mr. Jamie Harrison for taking the time out of his very busy schedule to record that special message um, for our event today. Now, I think we're getting to this place where um, everyone is just eager to hear the voices of those who have graciously agreed to spend their time today with us as we honor the life and legacy of Dr. King. Each of them are activists and leaders in their own rights. I won't read their full bios, but I will just say a little bit about each one of them as I introduce them. And so um, we have with us Ms. Tamika Atkins. If you have been watching Georgia, all eyes have been on Georgia this uh, election cycle this year and all of the movement that happened in Georgia. Um, she is the executive director of Pro Georgia and definitely embodies the principles of Dr. King in mobilizing and giving voice to the people on the ground. And I am so honored that she is spending her time with us today. So thank you for being here with us, uh, Ms. Atkins. Next, my dear friend, Dr. Eddie Moore. I have known Dr. Eddie Moore for a very long time. I have sat at his feet. Um, I have had to learn and glean off of his knowledge and wisdom and experience in doing this racial equity work. Dr. Eddie Moore is the founder of the Privilege Institute and the White Privilege Conference. He has um, written several books. He's an educator. Um, and an activist and definitely someone that I'm eager for you all to hear um, his thoughts uh, about where we go from here. And last, and certainly not least, I am so honored to have with us Mayor Timothy Raglan. Uh, mayor Timothy Raglan is the first black mayor of Talladega. And I actually want to just say, I want to claim him as my home team. I'm not actually from Talladega, but I was born and raised in that county. And um, he is also a young mayor. And so I am so honored to have Mayor Timothy Raglan with us to speak about the role of leadership and also uh, regarding the life and legacy of Dr. Dr. King and how that has influenced him. As I said at the onset of this, we are celebrating um, and honoring the life of Dr. King. And today is would have actually been his 92nd birthday. And given the recent events of what happened in our nation's country last week, and just what we've seen over the last four years, uh, I always feel that it's befitting that we start and we begin um, at those places that inspire us and that can motivate and propel us to move us forward. I 
have been working in civil rights for over 20 years and never ever thought that this would be my plight. However, we know uh, how things plan out and how things move, kind of like Dr. King, um, who reluctantly became the leader of the civil rights movement in the South when he moved to Montgomery um, to work with the Montgomery bus boycott and later other issues. And before we get into our first question, I always find it necessary to go back to a place that inspires me as I do this work daily. I have the honor of working at the Civil Rights Memorial Center, a project of Southern Poverty Law Center. And out front um, of the Memorial Center is a memorial that was designed by Maya Lynn. And etched on the round table out front are names of 40 individuals, 40 martyrs who, were do who was doing this work that would eventually lead to Dr. King becoming the leader of the movement. And so I think about people like Reverend George Lee, who was in Mississippi, using his pulpit to advocate for Black people to go out and fight for their right to vote. I think of the work of Medgar Evers and all the work that he did in Mississippi. And we all know the murder of Emmett Till galvanized the movement in ways uh, that I don't think anyone imagined that it would. And we were able to see, the nation was able to see what was happening in the South. And so whenever I'm in front of that memorial, there's this quote that's on the wall. And it says, until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. These words are paraphrased from the book of Amos. But what's not on, inscribed, and these are words that Dr. King said, he says, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And I always think it's befitting to include those words before, because as we talk about doing this work, we know that doing this work requires us to move beyond our comfort zone. And so what I, I wanna hear from our panelists and we're gonna start with Mayor Raglan. Mayor Raglan, can you share with the audience ways in which Dr. King's legacy continues to inspire you um, in your leadership role as the mayor of Talladega, but also more so you are kind of among this rank of new black mayors in the South. And I think that that is very key. So Dr. Ra I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor Raglan, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Ms. English um, and to the other panelists, I'm honored to serve with you. Uh, you know, Dr. King was so intelligent. Um, I, I'm often, I have several, several of his books um, and I think my favorite one is his last book, uh, Where Do We Go From Here, Ch Community or Chaos? Um, and when I read that book, I, I find, as you were talking about inspiration, um, his legacy for me uh, is, is being able to stand in, in your morality. Uh, a lot of people in political office, um, and I'll just say it, once they get elected, they become cowards. Um, they're afraid to take a stand, to take the stand that they know is right. Um, a lot of times, you know, we try to put things as black and white, um, but in all honesty, as Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And when we look across our country, we see civil unrest, we see economic disparity, uh, we see inequ inequitable access to healthcare. And we have people who are in elected offices who are afraid to address those things. They're afraid to have those conversations about race um, because they feel they're gonna alienate one group or another. And I feel like, uh, you know, is one, my grandmother told me, you can't keep a Band-Aid on because if you keep it on, the wound will never heal. And so until we're able to take that Band-Aid off and talk about race as a country, uh, we're gonna continue to have this uh, cyclic cycle, uh, cyclic cycle, this cycle of uh, racial injustice. Thank you, um, Mayor Raglan. Um, and I, I do agree with you. If we keep the Band-Aid on, we'll never be able to heal the wound. And oftentimes we talk about um, truth and reconciliation um, and, and, and we have to 
realize that to get to reconciliation, we have to be truthful and we have to be honest about what racism has done to this country. Uh, Ms. Atkins, for you, thank you again for being here with us. How has this work, uh, how has Dr. King's legacy continued to influence your work um, in advancing civil and human rights? Thank you so much. Thank you again to the panelists um, for, it's amazing to be on a panel with the both of you. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, at Pro Georgia, we focus on voter registration and civic engagement, right? And we register uh, primarily black and brown people to vote, those of us who are impacted the most by voter suppression, right? But we do this in partnership with many different organizations. We do this in partnership with churches, we do this with community centers, we do our work in a way that voter registration isn't transactional, right? But that it is a part of building liberation, right? And a different future for our people. And that is the spirit in which Dr. King uh, has done his work. And when he talks about uh, towards the end of his career, the Poor People's Campaign, right? That again, registering to vote as an act is the beginning right? But centering people's needs, right? Centering their priorities and what they need to thrive, right? Having a living wage, having housing, having health care. These are the things that drive us, right? These are the things and safety that we want uh, for our folks and for our community and for our family members, right? And so we take Dr. King's spirit and we hold it when we're doing our voter registration work and when, we, when we're doing our civic engagement work. And we are very clear, right? The, the spaces that have been holding our work, who hold the values of voter registration and the values of like, like liberatory theology, those are the Black churches, you know, across the South and across Georgia, right? And so we are very clear who we do this work for, uh, who we do this work with, and our roots in the Black church. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing that because we do, and we'll talk about that as we get into the questions about the role of the church today um, in advancing social justice movements. And again, you mentioned the Poor People's Campaign and we, we um, talk about getting outside of comfort zones. Oftentimes people love that comfortable Dr. King. They love that I have a dream speech, but they rarely talk about the letter from Birmingham jail or um, when he was um, in California or even when he was in Chicago and open housing marches advocating for the right of housing for people like the necessity of having habitable, equitable housing. And so thank you for mentioning that because all of those ideals and principles speak to what um, Mrs. Kreisberg spoke about and that is building that beloved community. Thank you so much. Dr. Moore, See, we didn't lose him, did we? Oh no, there he is. I'm you. here, I'm here. Uh, 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 Sister uh, English, Taffney, I miss you, sister. I appreciate you. It's good to see and be a part of this panel. And I uh, look forward to hopefully meeting y'all someday face to face. Uh, you know, Dr. King, as I listen and learn more and more about the movement each year, I mean, three things I'm thinking this year. One is pancakes. I mean, if there's one thing I've learned this year or over the years doing this work is there are some pancakes you'll never flip over. There are just people who are going to hate, hate, hate. And just to, for me, think about the love and empathy and nonviolence in the foundation of Dr. King's movement, of the people's movement, is still astonishing to me, especially as I got a glimpse of what an angry mob could look like live on TV, right? I'm thinking, he's saying, love thy neighbor. That to me continues to challenge me when I think about the legacy and the work of Dr. King. Two, I mean, the way he continued to speak truth to America, you alluded to it. I mean, we get the dessert portion, but he was delivering some vegetables and beets, you know what I'm saying? The vegetables we don't like. I mean, he was delivering truth to America. And I really, I mean, I admire that. And sometimes I needed to be reminded that that truth has to be exposed. And so that's another thing that I think about 
in reference to Dr. King. And lastly, uh, and Sister uh, uh, Miss Cheyenne uh, mentioned this, that, that uh, action into words. I mean, I think Dr. King's work was about action and accountability. But what, what is really important for me though, is when you do the work effectively, as, as the distinguished mayor mentioned, that when you show up, win office and do it courageously, they will hate you. That justice in the pursuit of justice, I'm sure my sister can speak to this in Georgia, like when you pursuing justice, equity, it's not always gonna win you friends in every place and space. And so I just admired the, 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 the legacy and consistent pursuit that Dr. King maintained while, as we all know now more and more, better and better, I mean, they wanted this brother dead daily. Mm -hmm. And so I am just trying to continue to do the best I can to uphold um, uh, the work that I wanna do in the time we're in right now, because I think the work of justice needs some remodeling. I'll mm -hmm. close with this. I was trying to think about all the names that we've heard uh, white supremacist domestic terrorists referred to as, you know, started out as it used to be just the good old Ku Klux Klan. Now it was the Tea Party and uh, nationalists and alt-right and QAnon and Proud Boys and pa uh, my point is, it seems like they are in the lab evolving. Like they're, they're thinking about how to do hate better, more. And I just think this is a time for those of us in social justice to really be thinking about, to get in the lab and think about how are we evolving the work that we're gonna be doing, the work that's needed in the 20, 21st century over the next 25, 50 years. And I'm trying to continue to use the lessons and the learning from MLK, the civil rights movement, to really guide me to look at the future of the work. So thank you again for giving me the opportunity to respond to that. No, thank you, um, Dr. Eddie Moore. You touched on um, definitely core principles that we know Dr. King embraced throughout, um, as well as other civil rights activists. Um, but we know that he was very intentional that the work should be multiracial, it should be multi-ethnic, and it should be multi-generational. And, um, and you talked about, um, you, you said justice, the, the fight for it needs to be remodeled. And I was reminded of that yesterday, um, the King Center um, is having a global, global summit and listening to them talking about a collective unified agenda for those who are on the ground and movement building. And so as we think about Dr. King, Dr. King's ideals and principles, and Ms. Atkins, we'll start this next question with you. How do we incorporate those ideals of Dr. King um, to do this work today? I know when we uh, look at the work of Black Lives um, Matter and other movements that are building on the ground, um, there have been discussions about ways in which the work can be done better. And we've had this discussion about reaching across um, uh, generational aisles. And these are not conversations that weren't being had back in the 50s and 60s when the movement was building, right? And I think oftentimes people think that it's just today, but no, those were some of the same issues in the 50s and 60s. So as we look at where we are as a country today, and as, as we are all on this panel and doing this work, what should this plight for civil rights, what should that model look like today uh, moving forward as we think about our theme for today? You know, what civil rights should look like today is what we're doing right now. You know, I think, uh, Ms. Taffany, you make an excellent point. Some of the same um, critique, discussion, assessment, evaluation, tension, which is healthy for mm -hmm. movements to get better and sharpen and refine themselves, isn't new. Right? What's the appropriate strategy and tactic? You know, and I always, I always talk about from you know enslavement to black codes to Jim Crow to you know that 
we as a people, we have come so very far and we often don't give ourselves enough credit. Uh, our movement has only been alive for so long, right? And so a lot of the assessment that was happening in the 50s and the 60s is still happening now. What, you know, do, how do we censor nonviolent? Does nonviolent mean that we still don't do direct action and protests, right? Um, I, and there's a, a slew of thinking on it. And I'm a huge fan, uh, and I'm not the only one. Uh, one is that we need a multi-generational movement and we need a movement that is multi-pronged, right? Mm -hmm. um, we need to be flexible in terms of what strategy works at the right time. Right. And frankly, the moment that we are in right now, I think the moment that we see in Georgia, right, we ex we have been experiencing uh, voter suppression. Right. It's not new. Um, <clears throat> It's the new version is not having enough extension cords. Uh, the new version is we don't have uh, the Voting Rights Act section five has been gutted. So now election officials can change polling locations with little notice. Uh, you know, we have voter ID laws and in Georgia we have something called exact match where if your name doesn't look exactly the same um, or if your signature doesn't look exactly the same then you are putting a pending list. Um, and although you can vote provisionally these are additional steps that make it different difficult for people to access their right to vote. Now, what we see in 2020, what we see with the, the, the extraordinary turnout of Black voters uh, during a pandemic year, right? One that's based on organizing work that's been going on, not just for the last eight or 10 years for the existence of the table, but for decades, right? That's one. And two, Black Lives Matter in 2014 opened up a door it reopened a conversation about civil rights, right? And it connected, I believe, the history of the civil rights movement to what's happening now, to, uh, to the injustice system, to you know, the, uh, the murder of young black men and women, to the murder of young black trans folks. And it, frankly, it connected the dot from the history of the civil rights movement to what we are still experiencing now. And you can still see in terms of the organizing, building with churches, building locally, including housing and economic justice as a part of the civil rights conversation that is all built on the legacy of Dr. King and on the legacy of civil rights leaders. You know, I think it, it, it matters and it's important to note that uh, with the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Dr. Ralph David Abernathy, he took that work on and continued it. And there's, it matters that the Coalition for the People's Agenda, right, which is the voter registration organization founded by Dr. Abernathy, is still a member of the pro-Georgia table, right? So again, that multi-generational, uh, intergenerational uh, perspective framework to doing voter registration and civic engagement. Um, you know, it, so, you know, I, the work continues. I, I think sometimes, you know, maybe we focus too much on lifting up tensions that uh, 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 exist right now uh, without acknowledging or recognizing that these tensions are not new. And again, it's the opportunity for steel to sharpen steel. Oh, I love that. Steel to sharpen steel. And you're right. They're not new. Um, and I love when you said at the very beginning that they're healthy. And that is something too in the movement, Dr. King and others, Reverend Shuttles were, were very intentional about saying, okay, your feelings are your feelings. Let's work through them because we have something greater ahead of us. Yes. Um, Dr. Moore, I'll turn it over to you to answer that same question. And then Mayor Raglan, you after Dr. Moore. Yeah, um, well, I, I, I can't build much on what Sister Atkins said. I will say um, that when I think about today, you know, I think about issues like voting, like access, like education, uh, debt relief, homelessness, um, um, uh, um, uh, immigration. I mean, there's a plethora, there are uh, issues and concerns, I think, that can be in connection with where the work is today. I think the thing I'm trying to do really as I think about the challenges of the day and what some days can be overwhelming, but also uh, Sister Atkins has you know, helped me to remember that, I mean, there's been some folks grinding for decades, really getting some real things done in our nation, despite all the challenges. 
And so trying to hold both of those spaces. And I think for me, when I think about civil rights today and, 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 and the work, it's really about focusing organizationally, the Privilege Institute, the White Privilege Conference, on really building community, building relationships, trying to be in support, particularly across um, identities. I mean, I think there's some real questions being asked about the role of white people in this time, during this time. And so, um, and myself, you know, grappling with, you know, how much time to invest and how much time to be in partnership and collaboration. And so that's something I've been thinking about, uh, you know, being located in the Midwest and really looking at some of the mounting challenges there in the Midwest corridor. So I'm still grappling with that, but I, the question for me at this time in reference to the movement is the role of white people, mm -hmm. the partnership with white people, the trust of white people, the belief in white people, these are some of the things I'm grappling with as I think about today that carry on from the past. And then also um, trying to think about particularly young people, especially um, BIPOC, uh, but uh, black folks, uh, young black males, specifically just because that's some of my research area and, and, and looking at the work of Sean Rochester in the black tax and really focusing over the next 25 years in assisting in role modeling black wealth, black ownership, mm -hmm. and really trying to, as part of uh, my contribution to the success and the work of civil rights is really uh, assisting young people, especially in the understanding of black capital, black wealth, and building and owning in order to do good things. You can have a lot and you can do a lot. And so that's some of what I'm thinking about as I think about the future of the work and the lessons I've learned over the past. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll pass it on to the distinguished mayor from here. Mayor Raglan. You know, you, you guys, man, y'all, y'all some bad folks. I tell you, <laughs> um, I, I think we, you know, we have many lessons that we can learn from the civil rights movement of the fifties and the sixties, um, such as ensuring as, as Ms. Atkins said, um, that young people have seats at the table. Um, you know, we know Dr. King was only 26 years old when he began to lead and be the spokesperson for the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and I'm really excited about, uh, and we see Georgia um, ha has been a turning point and is really excited a lot of people across the deep South. Um, and I'm excited about Alabama because we have some people who are millennials that are taking um, leadership roles in our state. We got Mayor Messiah Williams Cole, um, in Camp Hill, Alabama. He's only 21 years old. We have um, Councilwoman uh, and Vice Mayor of Anniston, Alabama, Sierra Smith. She's only 21. We have um, Crystal Smitherman in Birmingham. She's a Councilwoman, she's only 27. Um, and so we have a lot of young people who are um, taking on that leadership role and they're unapologetic in their blackness, they're unapologetic um, in who they are and they're energetic and it's really exciting. Um, also, I think a lesson that we can learn also is that you, ha you have to be able to protest, but you also have to be able to um, ignite policy transformation. Um, one of the major strengths of the civil rights movement was that its goals and its objectives were concrete. Um, they strove to achieve equality and justice for black folks, excuse me, through the establishment of civil rights, um, like the right to vote, desegregation of schools, public transportation, uh, and other public facilities equal access to jobs and housing. Um, they did all of this, uh, as Dr. Moore said, um, among these, these angry mobs, right? Um, you know, they even faced some pushback from folks in, in the black community. And of course, you know, they had death threats and bombs being thrown through their windows and, and all that kind of stuff. And today we see those threats of violence seeking to dismantle that which black people have established even amongst this pandemic, right? Uh, with the through the protests uh, that we've seen around the world, even uh, with George Floyd's uh, death, murder, George Floyd's murder. Um, and then I think the last lesson is that based on the demands, they develop strategies and tactics to realize their objectives through organizational structures and networks that they built. Um, you know, we had SNCC, we had the SCLC, um, 
and, and all the other organizations that, that, were, that came about during the civil rights movement. Our strategies, particularly those led by black women like Ms. Atkins in Georgia and, and so many others have shifted uh, Georgia from red to blue and given states across the South hope um, that a new, a new South is on the horizon. Um, and like that lyrical, one of, one of my favorite lyrical poets, Andre 3000 says, the South has something to say. So I'm, I'm excited. Thank you, Mayor Raglan. Um, you, you actually trans, you touched on something that will transition us into our next question. And you said um, in igniting policy um, for transformation and Dr. William Barber, um, I, I love him of the Poor People's Campaign. He talks about having a moral revival. And again, he doesn't want us to get caught up in language, right? Because he says, in order for us to really affect change, it's so much bigger than us just getting along. Um, and so much more than us just being able to live in community together. But we've got to transform racial um, policies and policies um, that uh, have to eradicate poverty um, in this nation. And specifically, you talk, talked about the South, specifically the Deep South, right? Um, and there is the saying, so goes the South, so goes the rest of the nation. And so we know that policy is critical um, and we know that those in uh, elected positions are critical in this, but communities are critical in the shifting of policies as well. And so Ms. Atkins, we'll begin this next question with you. If you could uh, share with us ways in which your organization is working to educate individuals about policy, um, and also mobilizing legislatures and those in elected office to change those policies so that it benefits uh, the greater society at, um, at large. Thank you. So I wanna just remind folks a little bit about who Pro Georgia is. And we are a state-based table. We are one of about 25, 26 tables that make up the State Voices Network. Uh, and here in Georgia, I have the privilege to work with 38 different uh, organizations, including Southern Poverty Law Center, um, who have different policy priorities, different social justice priorities. But what we all agree is that we have a, a shared base right? Shared population of communities. Um, we don't live, right? Um, one issue lives. And so when we are all fighting for LGBTQ advocacy, housing, education, economic justice, that we agree that our folks, uh, part of power building has to be registering them to vote and then getting them out to vote. And so why I say this, how we do our work is called integrated voter engagement. And that means that we do not show up in September, uh, register you to vote and then disappear, right? Our partners are in the community year round and they're, and they're tying civic engagement, um, frankly, just to community organizing, right? And meeting folks where they're at. Uh, so that means that uh, we may have registered you to vote over the summer, we wanna make sure that you come out to vote during the fall and we do the follow-up, the calls, the text messages, when we could be in person, local community events where we continue the conversation. But then when it comes time for the legislative session, right, we are also contacting you, right? Because we can, there are a list of legislation that may negatively impact you, your family and your community. And we wanna make sure that you are, are part of holding your elected official accountable, right? So supporting people, training them up so that they can uh, lobby for themselves and show up at the state capitol and say, hey, you know, uh, I live in your district and I have something to say about this bill that you sponsored. So as Pro Georgia, we do a lot of coordination, right, in the background. And our partners are the ones who do, who do the heavy lifting when it comes to policy and policy transformation. So I fully believe everybody has to play their role to get the work done. But I will say this, policy is very important. And, and the way we do our work is one, we wanna make sure that you can access the ballot. And that's when we combat voter suppression. That's when, you know, voter ID laws where we are, or, or the fact that Georgia has 159 counties, but we don't have a, a, a standardized early voting, right? Across all 159 counties, right? It's like these different fiefdoms, right? So one, we wanna make sure that you can, you can vote. The second thing we want to do is make sure that you want to vote, 
right? That this is not a pine sky, complicated, uh, distant from you and your daily living, right? That you see voting as a direct way to impact and improve your life, right? So now that you can vote, you want to vote and you do vote, here's the next thing. How do we make sure that your vote and your voice isn't diluted, right? Through gerrymandering and redistricting, through packing and cracking of districts, right? And so I say, I lay all that foundation to say, particularly in the South, right? That we need elected officials that actually represent the will and the needs of the people, right? Because we need them, right, to support uh, and implement policy that will eradicate poverty, right? But we need elected officials that actually feel accountable to the people of Georgia and not to their special interests. And so we've now had the census, which was this huge thing, right? Now we have the, the count, and, you know, and there's still ongoing conversations about that. But why that matters is that when we are finished with the census and we are ready to draw district lines, we have to make sure that districts are not drawn in a way that they put all the black folks together or they put all the black and brown folks together to reduce our representation down at the state capitol, you know, or they sprinkle us out right, so that we are still, uh, our voice is diluted uh, because we are, not, it's not equal representation, right? So I, I know that, you know, Dr. Moore and Mayor Ragland are gonna talk more about policy, but, you know, I'm also like, why, why is it so hard for us to have good policy implemented? That's, and so we at Pro Georgia, we're really focused on the redistricting and making sure that our voices aren't diluted. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moore. Uh, well, I tell you what, uh, the young mayor there's got me inspired. Maybe I might have to go back to my hometown and do some investigation to, 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 to do it courageously. I'm, I'm, I'm just, again, really um, inspired by this question. Uh, uh, my motto when it comes to, if change is what you want to see, you have to understand policy ideology. Mm. Okay, so, uh, you know, as a 501c3, we have to be careful around the politics of where we situate ourselves and really where we focus and the programming that we do, and particularly working with young people, is understanding ideology. And again, we're in the Midwest where it's sweeping whiteness across the corridor, everywhere you go. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not always opposed to that unless it's tied to ideology. And I think that's some of the conversation we're trying to do in teaching about white supremacy, white privilege and other forms of oppression from an ideology perspective. Because we know across this nation, I mean, Jim Lowen, who's done some great work across the South talks about and has researched and exposed these, what he calls sundown towns. What I think we got to look at is when you find a sundown town, you probably got a sundown municipality, a sundown school, a sundown church. I mean, the policies echo, ripple throughout the community. And so I think that's where we're trying to spend work with future leaders and being able to understand the verbiage of white supremacy ideology, the behavior patterns the strategies to push back. I mean, even the ability to say white. I mean, there's some places where you can't even still say white. Uh, try saying white supremacy. But I think that's really where we're trying to equip future leaders, folks who are gonna be in the policy change and the policy environment is really understanding the ideology, having the skills and the knowledge to be able to challenge the hiring, the recruiting, the promotion, right? the, the directive, the, the mission vision, because uh, um, I mean, y'all know this, y'all in the South, deep in the South, and I don't have to explain that to you, but there's still some places across the US, the Midwest, that just folks believing that it's this way because it's always been this way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's some of where I'm and some of what I'm and we're looking at as an organization to be a hub, to be a place that if people want to understand that ideology of white supremacy and its impact on policy and structural systemic design so that you can then change it, that's the kind of space and place we want to be. You can't change white supremacy if you can't say white supremacy, if you can't understand 
white ideology, white supremacy ideology. And so that's where we're really focused as an organization, organizing as an organization with our programmings, with our events. So I yield to the distinguished mayor. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, you know, I, I'm reminded of the quote by Dr. King um, in reference to policy, uh, just to highlight how important policy is. Um, he said, it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me. And, um, you know, we have a lot of times we have this moral argument about whether um, policies that combat systemic racism are um, necessary, whether it's moral. Um, you know, and, and for me, I, I don't care if you think it's right or wrong morally, you know, there should be laws that where police cannot brutalize anybody. There should be policy in place that present that prevents uh, you know, mobs from storming the Capitol and with, with zip ties um, and threatening to kill police and members of Congress. And then they being, they're able to go home and, and get on social media and brag about it. Um, so I think as far as policy wise, we have to be able to admit that systemic racism exists. Like that's the base level. Um, then we have to get involved with organizations that are actively fighting against systemic racism. And, and elect leaders who are, as Dr. Moore said, um, I'll paraphrase Dr. Moore, uh, who have done the reading, they understand how the system works and how, because you can't fix something that you don't understand, right? Um, so we need to elect leaders who, who, who fit that mold. And we also have to elect leaders who will not support and reinforce fundamentally racist policies. Um, you know, we have so much structural racism in education. Um, you know, your zip code determines how far you go in the educational system. Um, we have, you know, we can think of just, just highlighting redlining in housing. Um, we have structural racism in economics. And so we have to be able to, to have honest and real conversations about how these things affect people. Um, and you know, there's this misconception that structural racism, systemic racism only affects, only affects black and brown folks. That's not true. It affects everybody. And until we can, until we can have that conversation, until we can really um, get into when Dr. King said, I never intended myself um, to adjust, I never intended to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few, right? That's where we are in America right now. And I think, um, like I said, with the leaders that we have coming across the deep South uh, in other pla and other places, I think we'll see some of that stuff trying to start to change. Thank you for that, um, Mayor Raglan. I want to just um, reiterate something that you said toward the end that, um, you know, we really have to move outside of talking about policy um, and people stay away from policy because they think it will only affect change for black and brown people, right? It's something like if I give you something, um, then that's going to take something away from me. Earlier this year, I was participating in a webinar with the Highlander Center, and, um, and we were just talking about how do we get people to the table, right? If we were, if we look at our communities, right, if we look at poverty, both in the Black, Brown, and White community, if we can get them to the table to help them to understand how these policies are affecting us all, right? And I think Ms. Atkins, um, what... Pro-Georgia has done is a model that I think should be modeled everywhere. And you spoke to that earlier. And that's about building a coalition of organizations who are at the table. And I've looked at that list on Pro-Georgia. And these are organizations that run the gamut, that provide direct services. Um, you know, they're working on child care. They're work, working on issues that matter. And Mayor Raglan, you mentioned um, the issue of housing and how redlining um, just took wealth 
out of uh, what were predominantly middle class black communities and what that did to black communities. But what it continues to do is putting money in the pocket of a few. And then we're left with these uh, areas are of high poverty. And you said it and it should your zip code matters. Right. Because your zip code, not only does it determine where you go to school or the quality of your education, it also determines your quality of health care. And if we haven't seen that before, we should have seen it, given what we just what we're going through now. We're in the midst of a pandemic. And we know that um, those racial and economic disparities existed prior to the pandemic. And the pandemic has just heightened or raised the awareness of that in, in the Black communities. And before we transition to doing Q&A, um, we are running on time. Before we transition to doing the Q&A, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the ways in which we do this work um, and if I didn't talk about the pandemic that has plagued us all, but how has it changed, one, how you think about your work and how you think about the people who are receiving less than quality care in the midst of this pandemic? And we will start with uh, Mayor Raglan. <laughs> yeah, so um, I was inaugurated in November, 2019. And then, uh, I don't know, three, four months later, we, we are in the throes of the uh, global pandemic. And so um, for me, as a, at, at the local level, I don't have the authority or the um, capacity to get to, to, at the time, I thought I didn't anyway, to order mass mandates and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so I followed our procedure, which is to go to the council uh, and to say, hey, this is what I see going on. Let's get ahead of it. Let's do a mass order. Let's do uh, stay at home orders, that kind of thing. And, and they fought me. Um, and so I said, well, I'm just going to have to do this uh, on my own. So I did the executive order thing uh, to put those things in place. And of course, I was threatened, you know, with suits and all this kind of stuff. Um, so for me, this pandemic has highlighted, uh, even though it's something you, you, you intuitively know, but there's a difference between having, you know, the intuitive knowledge of something and then having the lived experience of it. Um, and so it, it highlighted for me that people don't really care about the people they say they care about. Um, you know, we, we oftentimes when it's election season, people say, you know, they make these promises, they say, we're gonna to come together, we're gonna to do the best thing for the community. Uh, but when the rubber meets the road, uh, as Ms. Atkins said, people, a lot, of a lot of elected officials are listening to their special interest. They're listening to the folks that gave them money um, and, and that's just that. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. Um, secondly, it's really shown that how resilient people are. Um, you know, throughout this, 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 these trying, trying times, you know, we, we, we're battling, pan, we're battling a health pandemic, we're battling economic disparity, we, we are seeing civil unrest, we're seeing um, constitutional crises. Uh, and through it all, I've seen the people in my city be uh, amazing. I mean, I have to highlight, um, we, we've had a $2 million surplus uh, in our fiscal budget for this year, or for the last fiscal year. Um, we, we've seen new businesses opened by young black folks um, who, you know, were by all accounts not supposed to be open in those type of, the type of businesses that they've opened. And so I'm really inspired, um, you know, when, when the days are long and I'm frustrated and, you know, it's just like, man, what else can go wrong? I look at those people and I, and I think, how dare I? Get, how dare I give up? How dare I throw in, throw in the towel? Because people are counting on me um, to help help make their lives better. So that's where I am. Thank you, Mayor Raglan. Dr. Moore and then Ms. Atkins to close out this question. Yeah, um, I mean, one of our slogans at the Privilege Institute is if you have a lot, 
you should do a lot. And I think pandemic has really uh, given us an opportunity, given me an opportunity to just think about, you know, stuff, you know, what, what, I mean, what's really important? Um, what's, 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 what's really needed and, um, uh, uh, and how to be really, particularly locally in the place you live, where you live, contributing back to uh, folks who are really experiencing some difficult times. I mean, the pandemic, uh, as we all know, has just illuminated the disparities, the inequities. Um, I mean, we've seen shows like the haves and have nots. I mean, the second thing I've been doing is realizing, whoa, 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 I might be a have. I mean, because of, you know, I mean, when I look at where I come from, that's where I'm at. I can't be, I can't keep telling folks about giving back, about, you know, doing a lot if I'm not role modeling that. So pandemic has also checked me up on what I'm doing, how I'm giving back. Um, little things, I mean, just, you know, every day just being blessed, thankful for uh, the morning because this pandemic has wreaked havoc on families across the world, uh, closing in on 2 million deaths in reference to the pandemic. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's been really helpful for me to just do some reflecting on little things, those little relationships, those little moments. Um, uh, thinking about my work lasting beyond me, you know, just really what is the legacy work I'm leaving behind as I feel like, you know, I've been doing some good work, but I mean, pandemic has just had, had me thinking about, I mean, borrowed time essentially. And so um, I think about that. Uh, I, I think when the times get tough, you know, uh, uh, you realize what it is you've been called to do. The pandemic has helped me understand that this is my work. I mean, this is what the Lord called me to do. And I, I measure that because, I mean, I feel like I'm more creative and I have a sense of care. I think those are really important when you know this is the work you should be doing and pandemic has helped me uh, with that as well. Last thing I'll say is, I mean, I need people. I miss people. I mean, I, I mean, I mean it's, it's I, I just can't imagine being 12, 15. I mean, some of what kids are dealing with across the nation. Um, I mean, I think this pandemic has to have us thinking about and really uh, remembering what Dr. Joy DeGruy talks about when that injury happens and you can't really measure it. You can't even assess it. When we may be rippling it right in our own home because of what we're bottling up. And so just really trying to take some time to self care and think about just um, pandemic actually asking you to be distancing yourself from people when we need people, if that makes sense. So those are some of the things that I've been pro processing in reference to pandemic and thinking about the work we have to do as we look at the next 25 years. Sister Atkins, I pass it to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, a couple of things. Um, whew. We, the way Pro Georgia and our partners, how the way we do this work, like we have to meet people where they're at, you know? And so what that means, um, and uh, uh, Tafani, you mentioned like some of our partners and I, I came to the table through one of the partner organizations, the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Uh, in our case, uh, we uh, found during, um, when um, the Affordable Care Act was first implemented and we found out that Medicaid expansion uh, would not be uh, 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 adopted in Georgia, you know, we found that many domestic workers, nannies, housekeepers, and home care workers fell into the coverage gap and that they would benefit from Medicaid expansion. Uh, and we did our part. We held press conferences and we did um, interviews with the news and we delivered petitions to uh, then Governor Nathan Deal. Over 500 domestic workers signed petitions um, 
uh, encouraging him to expand, to approve expanding Medicaid. Uh, and instead, uh, and I've never heard of people giving up power, but the legislature that year decided to take the power away um, from the then governor to implement Medicaid expansion and making it a two thirds vote of the entire state legislature. And given the environment that we live in here in the South and in Georgia, we knew that then this was, um, you know, the end of the conversation. And so we all met uh, and, you know, my members, my member leaders were like, where do we go from here? And we said, well, we need someone in office that, you know, cares about us and supports us. And that's how we uh, got into voter registration, right? Uh, registering domestic workers to vote, right? And, you know, how we did our work is while we are recruiting nannies and housekeepers or home care workers, while we're inviting them to CPR training so that we can, you know, provide cheap or free CPR training so that they can then leverage that for better wages, we are also like, well, while you're here, we'd also like to register you to vote. So I say that as an example of how we do our work and how it's in the community. Um, that's how we always do our voter registration work across all 38 table partners. So I can't stress enough how we our work is not transactional. It's built into the ongoing community organizing leadership development work. And when we look at this year, this pandemic year, um, a part of a little bit of, of what we were left feeling was where it might feel slower, mm -hmm. but we were right to do our work the way we did it. Because that trust and that relationship carried over through a very tumultuous year uh, so that when we are now calling people and remind, we need you to vote, we know a lot is happening in your life. Trust me, we know we need you to come out and vote. We had built those relationships. You know, this year we've always known, right, in the South, rural does not equal white. Right. And I have lived in the South for 10 years. And that was one of the first lessons. Rural does not, that narrative you had from the Northeast cut that out right now, you know, and we learned in 2018, cause there's only so much, we gotta stretch the funding, right? We have to stretch the resources. And the reality is that a majority of our folks live in Metro Atlanta, over 60% of the state's entire population lives in Metro Atlanta. So when you're trying to make decisions for funding and resources, you have to make it make sense. And also the voices of rural black voters matter. Right. Uh, and that's when after 2018, we said we have to do better. Right. At expanding this infrastructure, expanding uh, the access to the tools. Right. The data tools, the, all the all the fun stuff that supports civic engagement efforts. And I'm talking about things like laptops and cell phones and tablets to do door to door in person engagement. And then we have the pandemic. And some ways that we said we're gonna have to do this differently, uh, we mailed out what we called civic care packages across the state. And like, we were like, we need to make sure that folks who still wanna participate in civic engagement who were recently employed by our partner organizations, many of them that are black, many of them that are black women, that they can still, what is it we can do? Although we focus on voter registration and civic engagement, we need our folks and the folks who we are connected to, to be healthy and whole and safe. So what, can we do as a part of this? And one is make sure folks can stay employed, right? Yes, we may not be able to do that in-person voter registration, but that does not mean that we throw you away. So we mailed cell phones, tablets, and laptops with unlimited data, right? And that's really important because we there is a, a gap right, in broadband internet in rural parts of the state. And so, you know, we started out with the annual um, uh, cell phone bill of $15,000. Uh, by June of last year, we hit $30,000 a month, and it was worth it, right? It meant that people had the tools that they needed in other parts of the state for civic engagement. We also said, don't bother sending these things back, right? Because at that time, schools weren't sure what they were doing. I mean, I, and I have a five-year-old and a nine-year-old that have been in and out, right? And at that time, no one knew what was happening with schools. Not every, no one knew if schools were going to send home laptops and iPads and the tools that they usually have, you know, if your school has it in the school. And we said, we got to look at our canvassers. We got to look at our network and our extended family as whole people. Again, what can we, how do we show up in this pandemic? And so that meant, yes, this laptop is for, you know, phone banking and calling your neighbors. And also you gotta get homework done, right? There's virtual learning, right? And we don't even know yet what that, 
Well, now at the very least, you have hot spots for internet. So you can, people still had to apply for jobs, right? That we're looking at families, right? And so being able to provide those tools to support civic engagement efforts, but know that it was supporting households, right? Black and brown households in particular, you know, that, that was a way of us pivoting because of the pandemic. And as we look to 2021 and beyond, in order to continue incre including that rural voice and our planning and our work and our outreach, we're actually gonna con continue the sending out of these civic care packages. And that's a different way to do the work. Um, the other thing I wanna say is that, you know, during the rebellions that uh, happened across the country, but also here in Georgia in April and May and June, you know, we provided PPE for, you know, we had a primary in June, it was supposed to be in, I think like February or March, then they moved it once, moved it twice, um, which is a whole nother, right, uh, bucket of confusion. Uh, but nevertheless, we said, we were already in the pandemic and we said, we need voters to be safe and we are going to distribute these masks. We're gonna distribute hand sanitizers, uh, we're gonna distribute gloves, right, so that for those who are voting in person, that they can be safe. And we sent these packages to our partners, right? So that they can distribute them to their community members. But we also provided masks for the rebellion, right? For, you know, people who were protesting because many of them were young and black, right? And we want to one, make sure that they're safe and healthy for themselves, obviously, and also uh, use this opportunity to increase and be safe now while you're out here. And also we need you to vote come the fall. Right, like how do we continue? And so we had messaging that went along with our masks, like stay woke vote, right? We had QR codes, we had handouts with information and voter education, but right, how we did the work, when we, when we think about the pandemic and what it means to make sure our folks are healthy while also holding our mission around voter registration and civic engagement, that meant that we had to like way deep into PPE resources and supplies, right? It was, it was just, a different way of doing the work. And again, always looking at folks as, as whole people. And the last thing I will say, I know around how's, how's our work changed when it comes to the pandemic. Um, like I said, um, and, and like Dr. Moore, you know, uh, alluded to the, you know, the children, right? Uh, I think there was an article recently that said 140,000 jobs were lost at the beginning of this year. And all of them were lost by women. Right. Um, and like the negative impact, like whew, how the, the what the toll the pandemic is taking on women, um, especially black women, especially Latinx women and Asian American and Pacific Islander women. Right. Um, it's a disproportionate toll that it's taking on us. And as a table, uh, you know, and we, we you know, talked to funders, we talked, you know, did what we had to do. But this was an innovative year. And so we have a child care fund now. Right. Because we want folks, we say we want black women to be leaders, right? Um, and if they are head of households and if they are holding many different hats, then how are we supporting them to still hold all of this work in the middle of a pandemic, right? Without schools, without daycare, without adequate support. So, so we, are, we are honed in on voter registration and civic engagement, but we do not, uh, we, we want people to bring their whole selves to this work. And this was a year where, you know, they say that um, your budgets reflect your values. Um, and, you know, I felt that this year for myself, for Pro Georgia, and for all of our table partners. Thank you all for that. So we have a couple of questions from the um, Q&A box. We actually have a lot that we won't be able to get to, but I do have a couple that I think are really important to answer, and they'll be specific to each panelist. And then we'll move into our closing remarks um, you, this has just been a wealth of information and I know our participants uh, appreciate that. Uh, Mayor Raglan, this question is for you. Um, as a minority, how do I keep administrative officials accountable? Um, there's an adage that says the squeaky wheel gets the noise. I'm sorry, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, get on their nerves. Uh, Call City Hall, um, or if it's your legislature, call them, email them. They should know your name. When they see your name pop up in the email, they should be like, okay, let me see what's going on. Um, and I, I know, and I'm not sure uh, how everybody's particular, um, I'm just from a local level, I'm not sure how your council meetings are going. Um, but if you're having in person council meetings, show up. Um, because I found that city councils tend to vote differently when people are in the room. Um, 
they tend to not have the same, you know, they, they have um, what Drake called Twitter fingers. Um, you know, they, 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 they feel one way when uh, the people who are opposing what they're trying to do are not around. And when they come in and when they come in the room, then they, they're more, um, they're more friendly. They're, they're more apt to um, follow what you want them to do. So I, I would definitely say, get on the nerves, call them, email them, um, let them know your name and face. You put them in office and, and they're accountable to you. Thank you, Mayor Raglan. Um, Ms. Atkins, this next one is for you. Um, is there a Florida equivalent to pro-Georgia? There is, woohoo! There is uh, one table, it's called the Florida Civic Engagement Table. Um, that is the whole name. There is also New Florida Majority. Uh, these are both excellent organizations that coordinate voter registration and civic engagement efforts, both from a C3 perspective, um, which is me, nonpartisan, just focus on getting the vote out. Um, but then there's also the, from the C4 perspective, right? Where now you can do a different kind of work, which is without, partnering with a candidate, you can advocate for or against a candidate as long as you're not working in partnership with them. So both from the C3 and the C4 perspective, we, we got the team down there. Thank you. I know a lot of folks will probably appreciate that one. Dr. Moore, this next question is for you. Um, and, the, and I'll, it's kind of lengthy, so I'm gonna make sure I get the question in. I have been com having conversations with my, um, white friends and colleagues um, to share life experiences, particularly around how they experienced or witnessed racism as young people. What else can white people do? Yeah, um, I'll say two quick things. One, um, I mentioned pancakes earlier uh, and how difficult they are to flip. I, I, I have to remind people, there are some folks that just won't change. You just gotta, come to grips with that. Two, don't spend most of your energy and intellect on the most resistant, all right? So uh, this work has to be sustained over time. So I would say that. And thirdly, I mean, there are now some things out there, the implicit bias test, the IDI, uh, the 21 day action plan. Uh, sir, I mean, there are so many resources out there. I would encourage you to go to the White Privilege Conference website, TPI's website, because we really have some resources, particularly as it relates to white people, working with white people, particularly in your families, but also your close networks. Uh, so please uh, go to the website or you can find my email there, my contact information, and I can definitely connect you to some other, other resources if you don't find them there. Thank you all so much um, for your time today. I really could spend the next couple of hours with you all. So I think we should, after this convenes, we can all have a midday coffee break and, and, and dialogue and conversation. But thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Thank you, Dr. Eddie Moore. And thank you, Mayor Timothy Raglan. In our closing, I do know that this is oftentimes the, the one question that people often pose. And that is, how can they get involved? Like, how can people get involved aside from working for a civil rights organization or something of that nature? So if you all could just take about two minutes each to answer that question um, before we have our official closing. And we will start uh, with you, Dr. Eddie Moore. So I, 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 I'm gonna go with the mayor's squeak. You know, I think, you know, the, the big thing for me is do something, you know? So uh, uh, the work we've been trying to do with the 21 day action plan is really giving people some concrete, actionable and measurable kinds of actions, micro actions as we refer to them. And so that's what I would say to folks. Most folks think they're doing better than they actually are. Most folks think they're more inclusive than they actually are. And I would say to have some kind of measurement, assessment, tool, friend, colleague involved in your growth, in your work, so that you can have some honest check-in. And myself included, even those of us who've been doing the work have mm -hmm. to sometimes get checked up around the work. And so that's my advice is to be in partnership, be in collaboration. 
and make sure if you say you're down with whatever, that you have some measurement, some assessment to assist in you in that analysis. That's my thought there. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Mayor Ragland, we yield to you. Um, yes, like I said earlier, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, so, you know, talk to the people who you have, uh, to your representative, representatives, um, look into getting uh, involved or joining local boards and commissions um, and make sure that you talk to uh, your rep representatives often. Thank you. And Ms. Atkins, I yield to you for the final. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, a couple of things. One is um, there is an organization called Showing Up for Racial Justice, uh, and Surge has several chapters around the country, uh, and that's an opportunity, I think, for white allies to get involved um, and to be in a space where you can have conversations about white privilege, where it shows up, um, have that conversation with each other. Um, and, um, and get support and resources from each other. Uh, I think another, another uh, way to get involved is, you know, organizing funds, you know, uh, becoming sustainers of organizations. Uh, I mean, and that could look like, you know, I love a good sustainer that's $5 a month. That's $5 a month that you can count on, right? $10 a month that you can count on. Uh, I think that's a, one, another great way to get involved, right? Uh, and then also volunteer. You know, um, I think volunteering is is critical, um, and by volunteering, following the leadership, right, of uh, particularly Black women who are leading some of these organizations. But we need uh, volunteers, and that can show up a lot of ways. That could show up uh, volunteering and making space down at the state capitol, right? Um, that could be volunteering when it comes to uh, phone calls, uh, you know, uh, outreach, right? There's just a lot of ways that uh, volunteering is uh, really impactful, right, in continuing the fight for civil rights and for equity in the United States. Again, thank you all so much for sharing your time, um, your experience, and your expertise as we celebrate and honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you all saw um, on the screen that there was a, a screen that showed how you can get involved. And we've also included those links in the chat box. We will send a follow-up email that will include this recording. And it will also be on our social media platforms next week. So again, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for being um, here with us today. And thank you to all of our attendees. Thank you for being supporters and partners in the fight for justice and equity. Have a great day. <laughs>